Okay, so this is a continuation of our previous uh, video in which we started discussing the concept exploration phase of the system life cycle model. And we uh, stopped in the discussion on operational requirement analysis. Today, we're gonna pick up on that discussion and we're gonna start here with the triumvirate of conceptual design. So in the previous uh, material, we mentioned the use of the six primitive interrogative in developing requirements. We also discussed that operational requirements focus on why using this uh, interrogative why and functional requirements focus on the use of the interrogative what. So the question we have now is where does the analysis go to understand the other four primitive interrogatives? So the answer for this, uh, or the answer to where to find this four, where, where to use or how to use these other four primitive interrogatives lies in what we call the triumphant variant of conceptual design, which is illustrated in this figure, figure 7.4. So you can see that we have this triangle the mat in the middle, um, which is representing the system concept. And then in each corner of the triangle, we have a description. So if we look at the top, we are looking at the operational requirements. And as we mentioned, these operational requirements are going to answer the question why. So why do we need this uh, system? Um, and we also discuss the functional and performance requirements, which are which focuses on the what. So what functions or what are the actions that this system uh, will perform. Then we move to the other two corners and we can start on the left side of the triangle and we have the operational concept or the concept operations. So in this, we can answer the question of how, how are we gonna perform uh, these functions? How are we gonna measure this performance requirements? And who is gonna be in charge of doing those things? And then if we move to the other corner, we have the operational context, which are the scenarios in which this uh, development or the system is going to be uh, working on. So here we answer the questions where and when. So where is the system, where, where are we gonna be implementing this system? And when in terms of the conditions, uh, if this is gonna be operating during daytime, if this is gonna be operating during nighttime, uh, is this um, system will be uh, the deployed during the winter season and so on. So three products are needed to describe the six interrogatives that collectively could be considered a system concept. A new product, the operational concept, sometimes referred to as a concept of operations or CONOPS, addresses how and who. And a description of the operational context, sometimes referred as scenarios, addresses the where and when. Operational concepts are useful since requirements should avoid prescribing how they should be fulfilled. That will be the, the goal of defining these operational concepts. And the operational concepts or the term CONOP is quite general. The components of a CONOPS usually include mission descriptions with their success criteria. So how are you gonna measure those missions? The, the relationships with other systems or entities, 
information sources and destinations and other relationships or constraints. The concept of operations should be considered as an addition to the operational requirements. It defines the general approach, though not a specific implementation to the desired system, thereby eliminating undesired approaches. The concept of operation or CONOPS clarifies the intended goal of the system. In terms of the operational context description or the scenarios, a description of an operational context is the last piece of the triumvirate in defining the system concepts. An operational constant description describes the environment within which the system is expected to operate. A specific instantiation of this context is known as a scenario. In the next slide, we're gonna discuss some of the uh, aspects that are considered when defining a scenario. Most scenarios include at least five elements. First, the mission objectives, a description of the overall mission with success criteria. The reader should notice this is the same as one of the components of the Canox. The mission can be of any type, for example, to be military, economic, social, or political. Number, the second element is the friendly parties a description of friendly parties and systems and relationships among those parties and systems. Uh, number three are the threat actions and plans, which is a description of actions and objectives of threat forces. These threats need not to be human. They could be natural, like uh, a volcano eruption, like one that we are looking at this figure. The environment is a description of the physical environment germane to the mission and system. And the sequence of events is a description of individual events along a timeline. This event description should not specify detail uh, system implementation details. So for example, when I was uh, working for General Motors, uh, and we, we had uh, new vehicles that were designed and we needed to test these vehicles in different environments. So they have these test facilities uh, representing those environments. Like if you were to drive a truck in a, a wet street or if you were to bring this truck to a high hill. Um, so they have all these scenarios and environments that were recreated to deploy the, the system and to measure the performance of the system under different conditions. Um, so mission objectives, uh, for instance, in this example, this could be um, testing the vehicle on, under uh, or for a specific, let's say for torque. So you are gonna, the mission will be to understand how much uh, torque the engine of the vehicle um, is able to generate. Uh, friendly parties could be a description of friendly parties and systems. Um, so in this case, this could be things like people or who is bringing the, the, the I don't know, things that are necessary for the environment. So if it's gonna be pulling some type of large vehicle, like a, a school bus, so friendly party could be that entity that is uh, bringing that vehicle, that bus, school bus to, to, the, to the environment. Uh, threat actions, um, so, these threats are not necessarily to be human, but for example, if you are again looking at the, the vehicle and if we 
think about the winter storms that were um, in this area lately. Um, so those could be threat actions. And, and if you wanna measure, or you should have a plan for, for measuring and for um, um, setting up these scenarios for testing purposes. Um, the environment, the description of the physical environment uh, for the mission, and then the sequence of events. Let's say you you have a maybe you don't want to test only one 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 specific uh, event. You want to test multiple events, one after the other. So that could be defined as a sequence of events, uh, which are represented by a timeline. So let's say one hour you're going to be running the vehicle in this hot environment, and then next hour you're going to put it in a different environment. Let's say the cold environment. And then you're going to be pulling a bull, a bus, and then you're going to be climbing or or going into a hill. Uh, so those are sequence of events. So most scenarios will have all these five elements. Uh, in this uh, slide, we have the hierarchy of scenarios. These show different levels of scenarios that might be needed in the system development effort. Uh, so we have a global at the top. These estimate total system architecture of effectiveness over an extended period of time. So if we if we think about that uh, case study that we studied in the at the beginning of the semester, in which we were looking at the Hubbler, Hover um, telescope. Total system architecture would be how to test the, whole, the, the entire uh, telescope and, and measure the performance. Um, at the second level, the environment estimate total system effectiveness within an architecture over one business cycle. Uh, so now we are looking at, okay, let's take this to an entire functional period and see how this performs. Um, and then at the system level, estimate the system effectiveness in its local environment. And at the subsystem level, estimate the performance of individual components of the system. So for the case of the hover, that was one of the tests or uh, the performance was not really test, tested uh, for some of those subsystems and that's why uh, it eventually was not able to perform as expected. In terms of analysis of alternatives, this involved the definition of a range of alternative system approaches to the general operational mission and a comparative evaluation of their op operational effectiveness. Um, such analysis define the realistic limits of expected operational effectiveness for the postulated operational situation and also provide a framework for a set of complete, consistent, and realistic operational requirements. Uh, some guidelines for defining alternative concepts. You first start with the existing system or the predecessor as a baseline and you can partition the system into its major subsystems. Okay, so having an understanding of how each subsystem of this entire system works, you can postulate alternatives that replace one or more of the subsystems essential to the mission with an advanced, less costly, or otherwise superior version. So what this means is, uh, let's think about, for example, uh, an iPhone. So every year you know that there's an update, but that doesn't mean that the entire system is different, right? Um, so the guideline for defining this alternative concept that is put into production every year is to look at all the subsystems, all the pieces that are part of the iPhone, and then deciding which one which area you want to improve or which areas you want to improve, make those subsystem better, put the system back together, and then you have a new concept. 
Um, these should be or should provide some advancement or could be less costly or it could provide you with a superior version of the system. Um, so number four, say vary the chosen subsystem or superior version sing singly or in combination. Uh, number five is to consider modify architectures if appropriate. And then number six is to continue <laughs> until you have a total of four to six meaningful alternatives. In terms of um, measuring the performance of the new system, uh, where the analysis of alternatives involve complex systems, the analysis often requires the use of computer simulation that measures the effectiveness of a model of a system concept in dealing with model with a model scenario of the system environment. The model provides control that vary the behavior of a selected system and environmental parameters in order to study the effect, their effect on the overall system behavior. So in this figure, I'm showing uh, a 3D animation of a simulation model. So for instance, in this case, if you want to create a new layout for your warehouse, in which you're going to be using some type of new equipment. Uh, to analyze that alternative, you can build a simulation model and measure the performance in a computer before you attempt to make those changes in the actual or real environment. And that's the power of simulation modeling. Okay, so now we're going to transition to the last part of this lecture, which is the uh, performance requirement formulation. And we're gonna start with the derivation of subsystem functions in which we're gonna ident identify the major functions that the system must perform to carry out the prescribed operational actions. So for example, a system is needed to transport passengers to such destinations as they may wish along existing roadways. So what are the functional elements? Among others, a, a source of power, a structure to house the passengers, a power transmitter interface with the roadway, and operator activated controls of locomotion and direction. Okay, these functional elements expressed in functional terms or birth oriented, these elements might be called power vehicle, house passengers, transmit power to roadway, control locomotion and control direction. Um, in terms of functional exploration and allocation, the exploration of potential system configurations is performed at both the functional and physical levels. To aid in the process of identifying those system functions responsible for its operational characteristics, recall that the functional media, or recall the, that functional media that can be classed into four basic types, signals, data, materials, and energy. So functional exploration and allocation are their operational objectives that require sensing or communications. These are questions that you can um, ask yourself. If the answer is yes, so this means that signal input processing and output functions must be involved. Question number two is, does the system require information to control its operation? If so, then how are data generated, processed, or or otherwise use. This can also help you identify some of the functions of your system. Uh, the system operational involves structures or machinery to house, support, or process materials. If so, what operations contain support, process, or mat manipulate material elements? Finally, 
does the system require energy to activate move power or otherwise provide necessary motion or heat? So these questions help you uh, explore the functions and also allocate those functions into these different areas. Furthermore, uh, furthermore, functions can be divided again into three categories, input, transformative, and output. Input functions relate to the processes of sensing and inputting signals, data, material, and energy into the system. Output functions relate to the process of interpreting, interpreting, interpreting displaying, synthesizing, and outputting signals, data, material, and energy out of the system. Transform transformative functions relate to the processes of transforming the inputs to the outputs of the four types of functional media. Of course, for complex systems, the number of transformative functions may be quite large and has successive sequences of transformations. <clears throat> so in this figure, we this depict the concept of these two dimensional construct, function category versus functional media. And we also illustrate the input transformative and output functions. So you see in the input area, we get the, these different type of inputs, signals, data, material, and energy. And those are described by SDME. Then inside the system, we're gonna have what is called a transformative function or functions that are gonna take this input and then are gonna transform this information, this material, this energy into something new using these functions. Uh, so for instance, if you think about a car, you have all these inputs. Uh, for instance, you have um, gas, you have the, the driver, you have, uh, especially the driver is gonna be performing or providing different inputs to the to the system. And then all these different types of signals, data, material, energy are going to be transformed to generate an output. In this case, the, the movement of the car, or the braking or any action that is performed with the car. So that illustrates that process. You get the input, you get this transformation of function, transformation, transformative functions that are going to be interacting with the signal, the data, the material, the energy in order to generate an output. Uh, so in, const in constructing an initial function list, it helps to identify inputs and outputs. This list directly leads the engineer to a list of input and output functions. The transformative functions may be easier to identify when examining them in the light of a system's inputs and outputs. So for example, if you look at a computer, you have these input devices, keyboard, mouse, and you have the computer, have uh, an output that could be the monitor, the printer, the speaker, the other type of outputs. Uh, and then the computer is transforming the actions that you're performing with your keyboard, your mouse, uh, maybe your microphone into a, I don't know, if you're, if you're working on an, an assignment, <clears throat> it creates the assignment and then you can generate that output. Um, here's another example. This is more simple, but I think it's a very good example. Uh, so we are gonna look at an example of a coffee maker and we acknowledge that this is not a, a complex system, but by observation and analysts can identify the necessary inputs for this system. So signals are the user commands. There's no need for data. Uh, materials are the fresh coffee grinds, filter, and water. 
Energy is the electricity and the forces are the mechanical support. The outputs can also be easily identified. The status, those are signals. Uh, materials will be the brew coffee, the use filter, and the use coffee grinds. In terms of energy, there's gonna be heat generated and no forces. So using this information, we can identify input outputs and outputs Identifying inputs and outputs assist the analyst in identifying functions. So input functions will directly proceed from the input list. This is what we call deductive reasoning. Output functions will directly proceed from the output list. This is uh, deductive as well. And the transformative functions will be more difficult to identify since doing so relies on inductive reasoning. However, we now have a guide to this inductive process. We know that we must transform the six, input, six inputs into five outputs. This line of inquiry normally reveals all operationally significant functions and permit them to be grouped in, a relation, in relation to specific operational objectives. Further, this, group, this grouping naturally tends to bring together the elements of different uh, subsystems, which are the first level building blocks of the system itself. So in the coffee maker case, we can focus on transforming the input materials and signals into output materials and signals. In other words, we can identify functions by answering the question, how do we transform fresh coffee grinds, a filter, water, and an on and off command in through bureau coffee, a use filter, use coffee grinds, and a status. Keeping the list of functions minimal and high level and using the bare object syntax, an example less pertaining to the coffee maker could be the next. Uh, so we have the input functions, we have the output functions that we have already discussed. And then the transformative functions will be to heat water, uh, also to mix hot water with coffee grinds, also filter out coffee grinds, and also warm brew coffee. These transformative functions uh, using the input, fu input functions will allow you to generate an output which is to provide a status to facilitate removal of materials and to dissipate heat. So hopefully this gives you an idea of how to uh, start describing your uh, concept or to ex explore different concepts for your, your project. Um, and I believe this is one of those lectures that are really important. So that's why I split it into two separate videos. Um, so I want you to look at this video. I want you to get familiar with this process because some of the, most of the things that were discussed here is what you're gonna be um, performing and explaining for the case that you decided for your project. So defining, operational requirements, using the information, uh, defining the requirements uh, and trans finding those functions, those transformative functions for your system will allow you to identify the, the subsystems that will be needed to achieve your final goal. So that being said, we are gonna stop now and we'll talk more in our next lecture.